Hey everybody, Justin White here, and you are about to listen to episode 29 of Power Forward. Our guest is Lamar Woodley, former star football player at the University of Michigan and a Super Bowl champion with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Long before he retired in 2015, Woodley was thinking about life after football. He's been involved in real estate, started a school in his hometown of Saginaw, Michigan, and is now pursuing projects in the world of television and film. You'll find out how Woodley leveraged his football network to pick up skills and build connections that would help him after he left the game. You'll also find out why he doesn't miss football at all, where he gets his creativity from, and what happened when he pitched his first show idea to Netflix, Amazon, and others. That and more with Lamar Woodley, right now on Power Forward. The primary purpose of this podcast series is to inform, entertain, and educate. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast series do not constitute legal or other professional advice, opinions, or endorsements of any kind. This is Power Forward. All right, welcome back to Power Forward. Justin White with Mateen Cleves. Mateen, as always, how you doing, my friend? Oh, Justin, you know, hey, baby, I'm just living a dream. Don't wake me up. It's all good. Well, <laughs> Mateen, we have been very fortunate to have uh, not one, but two Super Bowl champions on Power Forward. Mm-hmm. And today we are making it three, the trifecta, (laughs) if you will. We are very pleased to be joined by Lamar Woodley, formerly of the University of Michigan and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lamar, welcome to Power Forward. Wait, first of all, before we get started, who was the first two before me? All right, so so Sean McHugh, your, your former teammate. Okay, in yeah, okay, I know Sean McHugh, and and now your your neighbor out there in uh, in South Lyon here in Michigan, and uh, we also had Greg Jones, former Spartan who won the Super Bowl. Oh, okay, I understand. I, yeah, I see now. I understand why I'm a third person now. <laughs> get the Spartans, let the gut the Spartans. Oh yeah, here we go. I, I was waiting. I see. I had my timer out. How long is it going to take before we have the first Michigan Michigan State reference with you and Mateen here on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is, man. You know, Mich- uh, Mateen Khalees love Michigan State, man. So I would expect him to have some Spartan dogs on there first because he <laughs> loves Michigan State. Whenever you see Khalees out, he got his Michigan State gear on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know it, baby. Representing hard. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, well, L- Lamar, uh, as I mentioned, you had, a, you had a distinguished football playing career. You're from uh, Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, Saginaw. Went to Michigan. You go to the Steelers, you, you won the Super Bowl, you played in two Super Bowls. Uh, but but just to start off with, give our listeners a, a, an idea of what you have been doing since your football career came to an end. Oh, man, I've, I've been doing a lot of things. I got involved with uh, I got involved with commercial real estate while I was playing. Um, but also, too, I've been heavily really involved in, uh, in the film world, um, in the film industry. And I got involved with that uh, during my playing years. Um, I always felt like um, you have to think life after football. <clears throat> and I've always thought life after football from the moment that I stepped on the field because you're just one play away really from your career ending. Um, so I've always thought life after the game. So during my time in Pittsburgh, um, I had a lot of um, off the field opportunities that I would take advantage of during the off season. So, you know, whether that was doing stuff with uh, Max on magazines or going on different uh, TV shows or uh, all type of stuff, man. So I just had those opportunities and took advantage of the different radio shows also in Pittsburgh and uh, just got heavily involved in the film. And you said something that kind of caught my attention. You said you were thinking about life after football. And, and like, it said ain't so. Like, it's people think they're going to play to 80 years old. Like, not not me. I'm going to play this game until I'm 80 years old. Like, for you to have that mindset, where did that come from? When did you start, you know, thinking about life after football? Because I know some people – um, you know, and to make it to the NFL, man, that's got to be your life. I mean, to make it to the NFL, NBA, any major sport, that has to be your life. So how did you or when did you even start thinking like life after football, especially while you were playing? You know, what? because I, I can't I can't really say when did I start thinking about it. 
And if I if I had to like put my finger somewhere, I have to stay um, once I got to the University of Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a guy named Sam Sword there who just Sam just gave me the game when it came to thinking about life after the game and being more than just uh, just being more than just an athlete, but really using who you are and connect with different people around campus mm-hmm. um, and and change the the look of what people would think an athlete look like. He was like, man, wow. hey, stop wearing all that Michigan stuff when you go to class. Stop sitting in the back of the class. Stop sitting back there with your boys. Get to know other people that's here because – most athletes are only think they, most athletes are here trying to make it to the next level professionally, and everybody don't have an opportunity to make it. But the students that are coming here, majority of them are going to be something, and those are the type of people that you want to connect with. You know, let these people know who Lamar Re- Woodley really is. Don't be a jock or how they always look at athletes because you're gonna have enough people already doing that. So you have to change yourself. And I wasn't really that type of person, anyways. But I understood what he was telling me to do was be more than a be more than an athlete because you're always one play away. And you know, and and other stuff that definitely encouraged me um, is please when you used to do your camp. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Cleese used to hold his basketball camp at Northwestern. I remember riding through a couple of times. Cleese, I don't know when exactly we met, but ever since I've met you, it's been nothing but the same love and respect from day one. Oh, and yeah. every time you run across my team, Cleese, he's just giving you game. You know what I'm saying? So I remember coming into Northwestern and you had your summer basketball camp going on with the free jerseys and the free shoes. And you was getting on some kids because they actually didn't, um, come to school that day but wanted to participate in the camp and you had a rule about if you don't come to the class you cannot participate <laughs> in the camp and yeah. he, he was just he was just giving me that information and, and, the, and the same stuff that and that was my sophomore year it's, it's, it's funny I remember that but <laughs> I, I remember just you and Sam Sword just always saying hey man always go and give back pull other people out, go and give back. And that's always been your message. And I always respect you for that because one, we're not, you're not from Saginaw, you're from Flint. You went to Michigan State, I went to Michigan. You don't have to give me this game. So when you're giving me information, I appreciate that because what you're saying to me is that it's bigger than any rivalry or any hometown thing. This is about helping one another get into the next level and just giving knowledge and information. And let me jump up right on that because it's very important. You you hit on something and listen, like for people, aspire, people that's listening to this or watching this, you, you're aspiring to be great. You got to listen. You got to listen to people. That's how you get better. That's how you learn. And for me, I would always love to give back to you personally because you soaked it up. Like you wanted more. I mean, you, I would talk to Lamar and he was just looking my eyes. I mean, he was like, like he was just taking notes on everything that I was saying. And he was such a great kid, great person first, more than anything. So anytime I was around you, Lamar, I always wanted to give you because I knew you would be one of the people that would take it and, and take it to a whole nother level. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was taking notes, man. I, I was definitely taking notes. And to this day, I remember a couple months ago when we seen each other, You, we was at a basketball game and he walked in. I'm like, oh, they go Cleese right there. See, most people wouldn't get up and go over there and walk over there. They'd be like, oh, I'll catch you later <laughs> on, this and that. I'm like, hell no, I need to go talk to him. Now he might leave. I know when I go talk to that, that's a real dude and we gonna have a real conversation and we talked the whole game. Yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was just, he, he did exactly what I knew he was going to do. He was going to be honest. We was going to have a great conversation. We was going to laugh and we was both going to learn something at the end of the day because yep. that's what you get when you talk to him. Anybody that's ever had an opportunity, and I've never told Cleese any of this, anybody that's ever had an opportunity to have you around them should be thankful. You get what I'm saying? Because, I, man, just a few times that we've been around, you gave me the game. So I can imagine somebody around you every day <laughs> what that game really like if they if they ain't soaking up. That's different. I'm going to have you call my son whenever you get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to hear this. Like, For real. <laughs> it always been the same, though. Like I told you, that was my sophomore year when I came to your camp. Always been the same. And if that your message is give back. Reach out, help other people out. 
give back. That's very important for us to do because me and you both know that as an athlete in our city, we're looked at as the NBA players when we was in high school and college. And when we got to the pros, they looked up to us. You yeah. get what I'm saying? And, and you remember being in that situation when you were that young kid coming up and you wish somebody like Mateen Cleaves was there that you could touch <laughs> and talk to. So you yes. giving them what you wanted. You get what I'm saying? Like to have right. you right there in their presence. Like people don't understand how important that is. So when you do make it, give back and touch other people. Because now it can be 300 Mateen Cleaves. Because since the Flintstones came out, there's been a lot of Flint dudes coming now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Lamar, you, you certainly have given back to your community and to your hometown of Saginaw. You've been very generous. Uh, a, big, a big emphasis I know of yours has been education. You talked about the kids growing up wanting to be the next Lamar Woodley or the next Mateen Cleaves or whatever the case may be. Um, you have your own leadership academy in Saginaw. Uh, when it comes to educational opportunities, for kids. Why is that a cause that is so near and dear to your heart? Well, I think education is key, uh, definitely in, in today's world. You know, you, you understand why um, kids in your community fail because it's a lack of education. You know, and when I see my kids and the, the school that they go to, it's like, wow, like the, everything that they receive and the stuff that they learn, they learn the things that they experience is at a whole nother level. And I see why they're very successful. And then so you like our community needs something like this. We're giving kids an opportunity to have a better life. And when I started the charter school, of course, there were some people that didn't support it because people look at charter schools as taking money away from public schools. And it's a, it's a business and to make it, it makes the charter school look bad. But what they fail to tell you is everything is a business, whether it's public or it's a charter school. Hell, somebody's making money. Right. But in this case, <laughs> I'm not making money from the charter school. My thing is to give back to educate the more opportunities it is for kids to go to school. And sometimes you have to put a school there to make people around you step their game up because now they feel threatened because now they're not, they're not the only person on the block now. Yeah. So it makes them step their game up. And that's a great thing because at the end of the day, you just want the kid to win. So for me, it doesn't matter if a kid go to Woodley Leadership Academy or any other school. The goal is to make sure that we educate these kids, they go to college, have success, come back to the city and give back. And that way, everybody benefit from it. But the thing is, sometimes when the charter and, and, and the public schools, the thing is, it's a fight about money. See, to me, it wasn't about the money. It was about the education. So even though I went to public schools and I still love my, my schools and, and everybody there, this is, this is not a, this is not a, a a competition far as making money. This is about educating the kids. So at the end of the day, we want them to win. And if it's not about them, then what is it about? Shouldn't talk about money. We should talk about education because we understand that's why we keep losing. Oh yeah, I I loved it, man. I'm telling you, man. I showed all however many teeth I have in my mouth. I showed them all, man. When I saw that that you had the school, it, because the reason why I loved it because I knew they'll benefit from it. It's a lot of people that do things to put their name uh, 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 on it, and and that irritates me, man. That irritates me to to my core. That people that do things just to be pat on the back or just to say, hey, I I gave back, or their heart is not in the right place. And Lamar Woodley, heart is in the right place. And this goes back to when he did his camps. And, you know, not only the school, the school is, is the cherry on the top, but he's done so much uh, before that. Even like, you know, you would invite all these uh, stars back to Saginaw, Michigan. I mean, I would always go back to your, your football camps, but I, I was a fan. I mean, I would see all these big wigs you bring back so these kids could touch them, see them. So, like, for that, like, what kind of joy did you get out of that, bringing people that they only seen on TV, but bringing them all back to Saginaw, Michigan, out of all places? Um, well, let me, I'm going to touch upon the school, then I'm going to hit on that. Okay, okay. And, and, and like any other school, I'm not going to say my school is the, the greatest. We have our ups and downs. You know, we've only been open for two years. So, of course, you're going to have your ups and downs, and we're, we're rising up. So I don't want to say like, oh, yeah, we're just the top of the line. No, I'm not saying that. You know, it's, we're, our, we're in development like any other school. It's common. <laughs> but the thing, the thing about um, giving back, to me, 
I gave back for the same reason that, you know, we was talking about earlier, because you wish somebody would have done this when you were there. And it's always been in my heart to give back from the moment that my high school coach uh, took me to an elementary school, a bunch of us players, and we talked to uh, the elementary schools mm. all day. And to me, that was that was kind of cool because I, for the first time, I was able to put myself in the seats of them little kids and thinking, we're Saginaw High athletes. I used to look at Saginaw High athletes are like the pros. They was my Ray Lewis's and they was my Michael Jordan's. Like, yes. these, these were my guys because on Friday night, football is going to be packed. Basketball gym going to be packed. Like, it'll be <laughs> sold out events. So these were my celebrities. And these guys could say anything to me and I'm going to believe it. So for me, I'm like, now I'm on the other side and I know that's how they're looking at us. So to me, it was just about giving back and, and sharing my experience. And the older I got, like when I was in high school, I went back and talked to my middle school. When I was in college, I always came back to Saginaw High. When I went to the pros, I, I ain't go back to, I talked to Michigan, but you know, there's some, they got different business. Yeah. Saginaw High, I can show up. In the elementary school, I can show up and because I know they need it. Yeah. And I would always do that. And that was very important. So the, the football camps and everything like that, it was just, like I said, I'll bring all the players back because I didn't care what they playing ticket cost because I wanted these kids to have a chance and be inspired and motivated by seeing guys that they see on TV and have a free football camp. We don't have yes. to worry about being charged at no camp. This is free. You know what I'm saying? Even if it costs me a little something, we're going to make sure that this camp is free. We're going to make sure every kid enjoy this and they're inspired by it. And that's why, that's why I did it. I uh, did it for 11 years. I enjoy doing it. I love giving back to Saginaw because without Saginaw, there's no me in front of you. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. Michigan got me from Saginaw and polished me up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh got somebody, but I'm still from Saginaw at the end of the day. And a lot of people from my hometown inspired me in some way. Whether that was good or bad, it still mm -hmm. was an inspiration to me based on how I took it. And the conversation and the different guys that helped me grind on the football field from high school, middle school, elementary, they're all a part of me no matter what because we cross paths. So and, and my thing is this city helped raise and built me who I am. I can at least give back. And, and, and it's not people ain't asking for no handout money. Do something to give back to inspire the kids and motivate the kids. Right. Because you'll go and spend X amount of dollar on that nice car or that watch. Or the, take a couple of dollars and give back. Yes. And it probably won't. You can do it for free sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Well, you, you have certainly stayed true to your roots, Lamar. There's no question about that. Uh, and while we're on the subject of kids uh, growing up in Saginaw, I got to take you back because I, I want to know at what point as you're growing up playing sports, did you realize that football was going to be your path? You were going to be able to play big time college football and then after that, make a career out of playing football. You know, I tell everybody I didn't I played football because it was just fun. That's all I looked at. It was I never called it work. That just a game. My bad. Excuse my language. That was just a game. I was a grown man just still playing a kid game. Um, so when I was in uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a WWE wrestler, <laughs> WWF at the time. Like I wanted to be Hulk Hogan. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to be those dudes. They it, that was exciting. But as I had a chance to when I got to Saginaw High and I watched a guy named Charles Rogers hmm. all out. I mean, Real unbe deal. Uh, unbelievable athlete and. I'm watching him and I'm watching these college coaches come up to the school and they visit him. And he all in the newspaper and, you know, everywhere. So I one day I went to Yahoo in the library, typed up Charles Rogers. He was number one in the country. I'm like, whoa, hold on. I'm on a team with the guy that's number one in the country? Like, what? Like, every, I'm thinking of everybody in the country. This dude is number one and he on my team. I got it. I said... Everything that he's done, I need to do. I want all those college coaches coming up to here because I have the same, I felt like I had the same talent. So once I seen that, that's when I knew I can do it. I already knew what type of athlete I was, like, no problem. I ain't gonna let you muscle me around on the field. I don't back down, I got an attitude. So I was never worried about that. But now Charles Rogers showed me 
if you really take that to the next level, you can get this. And that's when I knew. Wow. You know what? And it's funny, you know, and once again, you took note. You know, you could have easily just sat back, but you had another guy that that was gaining traction. And um, you, you you was like, okay, I want some of that. You know, some yeah. people could have got jealous. Some people could have, you no. said, no, 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 no. Let me check this guy out. Let me look at everything this guy does because I, I want some of that action. And it's funny because yeah. every time I see Lamar and I love him, that's my little brother, and he embraced me, he hugs me. And every time he hugs me, I say, I am so glad I picked basketball. Like, <laughs> I would not want this guy as a quarterback. This guy chasing me down. Because when he get those paws on you, baby, it's not going to end well. <laughs> well it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I was talking to Sean McHugh, who I mentioned we also had him as a guest on the podcast. And when I brought up Lamar Woodley, he said, oh, yeah, I used to absolutely despise practice days because he was like the third string tight end, and he had to go up against you guys, get you ready for the game uh, that Sunday, and he knew he was going to take a licking in practice. So uh, <laughs> it, it's funny to hear you say that, Mateen, because I'm sure you're not the only one that feels that way about Lamar. Yeah, oh, McHugh, okay. you know, he did what he did. He wasn't no pushover. He went out there and fought, and he did what he did. He had a, it was always a good fight with him. You know, whether he was first string or third string, it didn't matter. He still came out there and gave it all, though. Yeah. And and you certainly did the same. I mean, you, you go to the University of Michigan. Um, I'm sorry, Mateen. My, my apologies in advance. Uh, oh, that's all which, good. You know, one of the most storied college football programs sure. in the country. For, for you, um, Lamar, what did that mean to you to, to be able to go play football at Michigan? Uh, like I said, a, a – nationally renowned school and program and also um, a school that's, you know, fairly close to home so family and friends could come watch you play. Man, you got to understand, like, growing up, I wasn't a Michigan fan growing up. I ain't going to sit on here in front like I was a Michigan fan growing <laughs> up. Like, I like Michigan State, you know, and I like Michigan State because of Mateen Cleese. You get what I'm saying? When the Flintstones went down there, I've wa- that's when I started really watching, like, Michigan State, like, uh, basketball, and we had a lot of guys from Saginaw going and playing at Michigan State. You know what I'm saying? So these, like, guys like Charles Rogers, Jeremiah McLaurin, Ryan Stanley, those three just in my school, yeah. you know, along along with other students and stuff going down there. So I, I was naturally a Michigan State fan because of I had people there that I grind with at Michigan State and then watching Cleves and then with the Flintstone at Michigan State. So that was naturally the team that I root for. And I wasn't a big football fan. Like, I just started liking Michigan State because Cleves and all the people. I wasn't a football fan. I didn't watch Monday Night Football. Like, I just, we played pickup football. But <laughs> when I got to the, when I, I became a, when I became a Michigan fan, probably about my junior year in high school. And it wasn't because of football. It was because of Coach Carr and Coach uh, Fred Jackson when they were recruiting me. And it was a it was a different love and in the, in, in the way they made me feel and the way they started talking about the things when you come to Michigan, the things that we want you to accomplish. You know, we want you to graduate. You know, we want you to be successful at the football. And they they preached academics, you know, and Sherry Atchell, every time I went on an unofficial visit, they talked about academics. And to me, that was important because like we talked about that one play away and your career can be over with. And when I went to other schools, their focus was more football. Like, I'm going to get it no matter where I go. That ain't going to be no thing on the field. I don't care. Who, I didn't ask how many first string, second string. How, I don't care who you recruit because <laughs> I ain't care about none of them because I was that good. Like, I don't care who in front of me. I'm going to eventually get that spot. But Michigan talked about the thing that I knew I sucked at, and that was academics. Mm. And I knew that I needed a push in that area. I needed to hear that they have tutors, they have everything that can help you be six. To me, that was important because that's what I needed. All the football stuff, I, I'm going to get that. And that's when I became a real huge Michigan fan and really start understanding uh, the history of it. Like, you know about Charles Woodson, and I, I, I've seen some Michigan football games, but I wasn't a big fan because I didn't know anybody on that team. Wow. Interesting. How about that, Mateen? Yeah, a Michigan State fan to begin. You know with. what? I, I got it. Michigan State got to do a little more preaching uh, education, baby. Come on, we let one get away. How do we let one get away? We got to sell education, whatever it takes. But let me tell you this, man. When I 
when Lamar was at Michigan, and I'm a Michigan State guy, I'm a Spartan through and through. I always had one eye on that TV watching Lamar. I mean, because he, first of all, he's from Saginaw, so we're like cousins, you know, Flint and Saginaw. We, you know, it's like the same. And, you know, just the passion that he went about it with. You know, it's like you had to enjoy watching Lamar Woodley. And and let me ask you something about this, Lamar, because you talk, like going to Michigan is not an easy task. Like you got to fight to get on the field. You know, some people shy away from some of those bigger schools because it's like, oh, no, I want an easy path. Well, you went to Michigan knowing you would have to fight just to get on the field. And then every year they're going to bring in somebody probably just as good or somebody that, that's just as talented. So what was you, what's your mindset? Well, how, how does someone go to a Michigan and what are you thinking? How do you what, – what, what's going through your mind? What's your mindset going through that whole thing? I know me. I don't, like I said, I don't care who on your roster. I don't care if a dude, this is first year starting. I don't care if it's a senior there. Uh, I'm getting on that field. That's self-confidence. And, and, and when I get on that field, I'm, I'm not coming off. And, it, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't nothing. I just knew me. Like, yeah. yo, I ball out. Nobody's going to outwork me. You're not, you're not going to, I'm not mentally weak. You can't beat me into the ground. If I get knocked down, I'm going to get up and you're going to keep seeing me all day. <laughs> like, that's my mentality. So, I didn't care who was in front of me because when Michigan get Lamar Woodley, they finna get a great player that's finna go all out and not only be a good player on the football field, gonna be a great leader on the team. Yeah. Gonna bring people together, gonna, you know, make people buy in and understand. They gonna get a, they finna get an all around person. So I, I was never worried about that. Anytime a freshman came in or somebody came in um, that they recruited, I, I don't care who they recruit, I hosted them. And I tell them, I host them. I host them. I ain't, I ain't, I don't tell them nothing bad. I host them. I show them around. Any question they ask, I give them the straight answer. Yeah. That's about any coach. I give them the real because they ain't gonna come there and say Lamar gave them some BS. Right. And when the players come there and they recruited some defensive ends, some lot, I teach them the playbook. I want you to have the best chance possible. The best mm-hmm. chance possible to come out here and compete. Because if I give you the wrong information, I ain't challenging myself because I understand this is going to be an easy match. I'm going to make sure you understand the playbook, please. I'm going to walk you through it, any questions you need. Mm-hmm. But I'm also going to remind you, you might want to go on the other side because I don't come out the game. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, you can get off. Over here. You might get two, three snaps messing with me. I don't come out the game. Oh, I love it. I love hey, it. Hey, that was, that was my mentality because I wasn't worried. I didn't think about who was in front of me. I didn't, I didn't think about it. wasn't no disrespect to nobody, but I knew me. I knew you weren't going to outwork me because, one, I like being in this spot. Okay, yeah. I like when they say the starting lineup, I like Lamar Woodley name being in this spot. I like <laughs> being in the newspaper. I, you know what I'm saying? You, yes. you like those things. So, and, under, and to, to consistently get that, you got to be in the game. That's right. So, I, that's why I ain't think about nobody. You, you can recruit the top dude. I'm going to teach him everything. He, I'm going to mentor him. I'm going to be his big brother. <laughs> but when it comes to playing, we can be out here on the field. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. But your game ain't like mine. We, yes. we two different. You a beast, but I'm a whole different beast. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to show you why. Well, <laughs> Mateen said it a couple of minutes ago, uh, self-confidence. You know, and you, you clearly you had that um, throughout your career. Um, and it paid dividends for you. Um, but work ethic, you know, you, you talked about you're going to outwork anybody. Uh, what is it about you that's that, that, you know, you have that work ethic ingrained in you? Where does that come from, Lamar? Man, I ain't going to lie and say, like, I got this killer work ethic. Like, I'm going to go to the gym and just tear it apart. I got work ethic when it come on the field. I'm mm. not no dude that's going to go hard in practice. I'm not because I'm not trying to get hurt because this is, like I even said, this is practice. But I'm still going to go out there <laughs> And I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm a give you a great tempo, but it ain't going to be game tempo because in my mind, it switched from practice and game. Like, I know this practice. So if I'm rushing the quarterback, I know when I rush, I ain't planning on hitting the quarterback. I'm not trying to tag off on you. That ain't no excitement to me. So, but when it comes to the game time and I turn that switch on, it's just like, it's time to go. Mm. 
It's time to go. It's, it's nothing else to think about. It's, it's like it's it's go time. You got a whole different mindset when it's game day. It ain't like practice. You know, I ain't you. You mess around, and get hurt in practice, but in game day, you see a whole different type of Lamar Woodley. It is. It's just. It just click on. So I ain't gonna be the first one when we running sprints out there. Just I'm not going that hard. I'm just not. My mind ain't gonna let me go as hard. Like, if I'm training in the offseason, I'm going to go hard, but I ain't going to go hard where I'm going to have to pick myself up and carry myself up out of here because I still got to live my life after I leave about this gym. <laughs> <laughs> yes, man. And you, my, Lamar, I mean, it's, I love speaking to, like, professional athletes or people that's great at what they do because it is that it's a, a certain mindset. Like, once you click in, that's the same mindset – I'm sure that people got to have going in a board meeting. Like if you going in a board meeting, it's game on. You know, you sitting, you've been in plenty of board meetings and met with so many different people. And I'm sure it's like game on. It's that same switch. If you got it, I mean, you can have it in sports, you can have it in business, you can have it in whatever it is, but it's just that successful being able to hit that switch and say, hey, it's game on. It's go time. Right, because it's, it's like you can practice for something all you want. You can practice for it. But it's different when it's t- when the light's on. Yeah. You know, like when I'm doing this film stuff, it's easy for people to read the scripts and be funny. They can be naturally funny to all their family and friends. But when we say action, yeah, they froze. It's, it's different. It's different. It's, it's different about it. So you have to learn how to turn that switch on and off. And a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people can't even turn it on. They think they can turn it on, but but they can't. You know, some days you gotta you gotta turn on that switch when you gotta get up and go work out. You're like, man, I'm tired. My body's still beat up. You gotta turn some type of switch on to get through that. You can't ain't no calling in sick. Ain't no, oh, uh, coach, hey, I got a fever. Hey, get down to the building. My <laughs> leg broke. Get down to the building. <laughs> ain't no calling in. You know what I'm saying? So now when we come into this new world, it's like. Oh, y'all taking days off? Oh, y'all at home? Oh, y'all on Christmas break? I don't know nothing about Christmas break. So since college, my Christmas break has been practicing. Mm. Even in high school, it's been practicing. If you get sick, ain't no <coughs> a coughing. You calling in? You sitting on? No, you coughing? Get down to the building so we can get you treated. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So that's that mentality now in this work in this workforce. Like, ain't no days off. We still gonna do Christmas. We gonna open up some gifts, but I ain't finna celebrate Christmas all day. While the Lions on TV, they making money. I'm finna be working. I ain't enjoying the Lions playing because they gonna be playing every year. I gotta get this. Mm. Yeah, but it was funny. You said you said uh, when we talked previously, your high school coach said, "Hey, if school's canceled because there's snow, we're still having practice at three, right?" <laughs> hey, Coach T, he always said that. You know because. You know, I played basketball in high school, so throughout from my freshman year to senior year. During Christmas break, we practice every single day. We practice every day. And then we had Christmas tournament, so that was killing your weekends because you got Christmas tournament. So about the time school rolled back in, you still on the same schedule. And the only days that we would get off was Christmas Day. Yeah, just Christmas Day. We still came in on New Year's. And throughout the school year, because, you know, it was wintertime, Coach T said, I'm going to tell you all now before the season starts. And he always reminded us, if they cancel school, we still got practice at three o'clock <laughs> because the roads gonna be clear by three o'clock. <laughs> oh man, I love it. Hey, <laughs> the roads gonna be clear by three, and that was and and Coach T was a uh, he was that coach that 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 took us earlier to them different high the schools to speak and everything. So that's what that's what it was. And 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 you find it's funny because Coach T and I know him, one of the best coaches of all time in Michigan, um, and even throughout the country. I mean, all the athletes he's put out and players and what he instilled in you guys. And when I look at you know Coach T, you guys were you benefited from having a great leader around you. I think one thing he was able to you you knew deep down inside that he cared about you. So he was able to get you to go over and beyond because, you know, at the end of the day, he cared about me. He has my best interests at heart. Now, you, on the flip side, was one of the best leaders that Michigan had, that uh, um, Saginaw had. So for you leading others, even now in business, like I always tell people, man, you got to get to know people first. If they know you care about them, 
then you got them. They'll go over and beyond for you. So is that your approach more so building that uh, leadership capital, getting that, that camaraderie with people before you decide to hold them accountable or so? So what's your approach on leading people? My, my approach on leading people is, you know, if you come, come, come to me with the right intentions, don't, don't come to me knowing you got some kind of end game and it ain't real. Okay. Don't 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 waste my time. Like if if you need me to mentor you or you want to have real in-depth conversations, come to me. But don't come to me with hitting the agendas, oh, I'm gonna get to know it, but then I'll get with some kind of backdoor deal that you're you you have going on. I, I like yeah. to now connect with people that just got a good heart. Mm-hmm. People that just really care about people. So I'm I'm really listening to people now to really seeing that they really care about people because if they care about people and they care about themselves, then they're going to work harder. And that's somebody that I can deal with. Yeah. A lot of people that I've dealt with in the past, they don't give a damn about themselves or nobody else. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But you, you try to see the goodness in them and yeah. hope to pull some out of them, but it just don't happen. So I want to work with people now that care about themselves. They, they know themselves and they know where the hell they going. You know what I'm saying? And they understand that they can't do this by themselves. They understand how important it is to have a team and have the right people on your team to be successful. You know what I'm saying? And make sure that some people have the same drive and the same motivation that I have. That Mm -hmm. they they look at some, they look at Christmas like me. They look at work like me. They understand that we are on a journey to get somewhere. Yeah. And and we ain't worried about how oh, man who making the most. Ain't no jealousy going on. We all trying to win at the end of the day, and we're all going to play our role. I ain't playing your role. You ain't playing my. I'm gonna be the linebacker, and you just be the D tackle, my man. And that's it. <laughs> well, well, you you kind of led me. You kind of led me, Lamar, to my next question. Um, you know, you you played linebacker. You were a sack specialist. Um, during your time in the NFL uh, with the Steelers, what you had 48 sacks in your first four years with the Steelers. Ooh, yeah. I mean, what, what kind of mentality does it take to play linebacker and, and to know that your job is to go get the quarterback? Man, I, I take pride in it because I don't want to let the other 10 guys down. I don't want to be that guy that you point the finger at for blowing something. I want to be the guy that you can count on to be there that's going to go out there and help the team win. I'm going to be the guy that understands the defensive end might not get no credit or the cornerbacks not, might not get no credit. I'm going to get this sack, but the other 10 guys on the field did their job. So when it comes to me, I don't want to let them down because I understand this is a team sport. Mm-hmm. you know, and, that, and that's something that I always felt when I played because even though it's me, it's the same way I felt about t- uh, t- telling y'all earlier about Saginaw gave me so much. That's how the players on the team that I'm grinding with gave me. Even though I won these awards and I all American and all these things and got drafted, it's because of these guys that's around me to help me showcase my talent. Nobody really showcased their talent without having some talented people around them to allow them to play. You know, like so when I when I came in, <clears throat> Pittsburgh was a a talented team, you know. They had just came off a Super Bowl, I think, two years prior to me coming. You know what I'm saying? And the, my rookie year, um, we made the NFC Championship. I mean, not the nah, I'm AFC. We lost in a wild card game to uh, Jacksonville. And uh, after that season, they let Clark Hagen go. And now it's Woodley in there. You know, I just had four sacks in the regular season. I think James just, he had like, eight or nine sacks because that was his first year start. So this is his second year start. Now this is my first year start. So now we we get on the team and I ain't trying to toot my own horn, but when Woodley come in, I come in my first year and get 11 and a half sacks. Mm. James Harrison now up to 16 and a half sacks. Woo-hoo. We go off on the playoff run. I give you six more in the playoff. I end the season with 17 and a half sacks. Mm. Pretty much lead, leading, leading the team in sacks. That year, we won the Super Bowl. You get what I'm saying? So when the, sometimes when Lamar Woodley step in, the, the, it elevates everybody. And I understand that. I know what I'm going to bring to the table. But I understand what these guys going to allow me to do and what I'm allowed them to do. You know what I'm saying? That's how the type of player I look at myself. I'm a game changer. You know, when I come in and it, it's just been proven. I'm tooting my horn a little bit today, but it's been proven. <laughs> I'll toot it. You know, I'm a game changer when I come in. The next the next years, 
me and James averaged double digit sacks. I had 13 and a half sacks the next year. Man. So we averaged double digit sacks mm. each year playing together. And a lot of people will say, <clears throat> Lamar Woodley benefit off James Harrison. And I don't trip about that, but we, as you see a team player, I understand we benefit off each other. Oh yeah. We all benefit off each other. So regardless of what somebody say, we all benefit off each other. Everybody yeah. number increases. That's right. And you, and you talked about James Harrison. So I got to ask this because you guys both monsters and great at what you did. Did you guys have a healthy competition going on? Cause I know some people, you know, they, they get jealous of each other or they want to be the one, um, and I think great teams always have that. You, you know, you got a team full of guys that hold each other accountable. And you got guys on your team where you have a good, healthy competition that help raise everybody else's game. I think it's, it was a healthy competition. And that's how the Pittsburgh Steelers defense was. As mm-hmm. a whole, it was more like a family. Okay. You know, we, we all looked at each other like families. We, we hung out with each other. We ate at each other's houses. So it was more of a family type thing. So I wouldn't say that it was anything like that. I think it was pretty healthy on my end. It was healthy yeah. because the only person that I was competing with was really me. I wasn't competing with nobody else. You know, I, I wasn't all James. No, I'm competing with me because yeah. if I'm competing with me, this is the only person that I really can control. I don't need to be jealous of somebody. I might look like, okay, he, I need to step my game up. Right. Help the team out because if, if his numbers is up, I need to get my numbers up because this is to help the team out. You know, even if I'm causing some pressure, I need to to get back there. But at the end of the day, it's like it's me versus me. And you and let me ask you too. I got I'm sorry, I had to jump back in on this because you got your coach. You know what I mean? He uh one of the best leaders from from afar, it seemed like to me. I mean, he's looked like such a great leader. And it goes back to that accountability again we, because it's something that championship teams have. And it's like, you know, you have a team full of guys that's holding each other accountable, that pushing each other. I know you and James, you know, challenge each other somewhat on the, the sacks. And you had in your head, I mean, it, it was this was what you were going to do. You were going to be the best version of yourself every time you, you jumped out there. But – Having great leadership bars, coaches, and uh, you know, how was that? How was your coach? You know, what was your relationship with him, and what type of leader was he? Coach Tomlin was a <clears throat> – he was a great guy. But I just when – I, when I look at something, I just can't pinpoint it on one guy. Okay. Coach Tomlin okay. Is, a, is a great leader. Mm-hmm. But he has some great people underneath him with Coach Dick LeBeau mm. and Coach uh, Keith Butler. Ray Horton, you know, Coach uh, Coach Mitchell. We had some. We he had a, he had a great staff of people. Yeah, the Rooney's great. So at the top was great. Mm-hmm. So everything in the building was just great. So when you walk in, it ain't nothing but walking into a family reunion. That's you how the buy in. it was. It was a family reunion when you walk in there. You knew everybody from the cooks to the 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 secretary, the janitor. You knew everybody. You can see Mr. Rooney every day. His his doors was open every day. He come mm. walking through the locker room. The door, it, it was just a family atmosphere. See, I grew up with Pittsburgh still a fan, so me getting drafted there was great. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's a family organization. Mm. That's man. what it is. It's man, it, it's it's a, it's great from the top on down. So so to be a part of that kind of family, and then to win the Super Bowl a couple of years into your playing career in 2009. Uh, you guys beat Arizona. Everybody remembers it. San Antonio Holmes with that, with that great catch in the final minute to win the game. How do you describe that experience, Lamar, to, to win the Super Bowl with an organization like the Pittsburgh Steelers? You know what? You really don't really understand it until you're done. Mm. That's when you really understand it. Like, man, I won a Super Bowl. <laughs> like, man, I'm watching on TV now. Like, that was – I won a Super Bowl. And you really don't really understand that until, like, now to me. Now that I'm done playing, I realize how big it is. Because sometimes, hell, I forget that I won a Super Bowl. Mm. You know, but understand how big that game is and to do it with your favorite team and help us get six rings. You know, to be a part of to be a part of that understanding that you're going to always be a part of history mm-hmm. because you won that Super Bowl. So to me, it's just like a it is still unreal. 
And sometimes I have to talk to people to realize, damn, I did win a Super Bowl. You know, <laughs> but it's, it's that moment now where you realize how big the Super Bowl is. For me, because remember I told you I didn't grow up a football fan. I was WWF. <laughs> That's crazy. What was your What was your wrestling name going to be, by the way? Man, I don't know. <laughs> it looked kind of changed. I wasn't going to wear them Speedos, though. I couldn't wear them <laughs> No, that may look Saginaw. It may feel comfortable like that. No, nah, I can't be out here asking no speedo. Now let me, because you, you just talked about Super Bowls, and I mean, like you said, you, you leave your footprint in the sand. That's something no one can ever take from you. Now you've made a transition into business. Now, um, for you, what would be your Super Bowl business wise? You know, what would be something so significant? It's like wow. You know, I did that. What? Because I, because you, I know you personally, and you're driven, and, and it's something else. You know, you're not your your chapters are not, your book is not closed over just winning the Super Bowl in football. Right. So, like, what would be that to that level uh, as far as business? How do you get back to that level in business? Um, doing film. Mm-hmm. I feel like the, this film world is is right up my alley. Um, like I was telling y'all before that <clears throat> I had started doing film when I got to Pittsburgh um, and how I got into film uh, every year when I, the moment I got to Pittsburgh I had a radio show that I did an hour a week and every year I would do a show and then I got on another show called Distiller's Huddle with Heinz Ward now this was all radio I love radio because you can you know I ain't no suit and tie dude that ain't me <laughs> it just ain't me I, I'm uncomfortable in a suit and tie because I'm feel restricted you know but radio <laughs> just gave me that Okay, kick back, I'm loose, feel good. And um, so I remember I did a show with the, with the, uh, another show. I, I forgot what it was. I did that. And then I said, you know what, this year I'm going to change the game up. I'm going to do my show mm-hmm. because I felt like I can do a show because I sit there and watch them do a show. So when you got Lamar Woodley on the show, I'm learning. I'm not just, mm-hmm. I'm not just getting no mic. I want to know what you doing. Wait, what's that? How you do that? I'm asking <laughs> questions. This is free education for me. Yes, Once you get yes. me in the building, I'm learning. It, that's what you're supposed to do. So I started mm-hmm. a show called the Lamar Woodley Show. I hired a production crew. Um, I went and hired a host. Um, I had my brother do an opening for the song. I uh, opening for the uh, the show. I created an opening for the show with me getting off like this private jet. Like it was it was wow. funny. Um, but what was unique about the show was that. Every every show was at a different location. Like mm-hmm. we did one at the the uh, the military uh, veterans uh, hospital. We did another one at the, uh, this lady was a chef. We did one there at the Pop Warner football game, the fire station. So I went to different places because I wanted to highlight different areas of the city because these people support us as well. And I think that it's important that we shine the light on them. I went even went to like a, a woman's shelter. Uh, with, the, uh-huh. with these young ladies and did a show there. Like I said, I wanted to highlight these areas so people understand these things are important and these are Stiller fans too. Um, so after that, then I did another, uh, I shot another pilot at my my boy in Saginaw. He has a phone store. His name is Charlie. Uh, I shot a pilot there. Um, and then I did a lot of stuff just in the off season. Like I did a lot of different TV shows. I was on South Park. Uh, so I, I've, I've done a I've done a lot of a, a lot of things, and in 2015, I I was watching Power, and I'm like, let's show everybody talking about. I'm always last minute on with this new technology. I don't be know what's going on. So I'm like, what's this new Power show? Everybody talking. So I'm watching. I'm like, oh, that's 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 I can write that though. That's good. I can write that. For the next like week, I'm just writing, breaking down the characters. I'm writing it down on on paper, because I can't type. I'm writing it down on paper. <laughs> I'm like, I got some here. All right. I hired a screenwriter. He wrote it up, which was my uncle's best friend. Mm. He wrote it up. I forgot he was a screenwriter. He wrote it up. You know, I would go through, help him change different things about it. I shot the pilot for it. So once I shot the pilot for that, I ain't really put it out there, but I still got it. Yeah. So then I did something with NFL Network called Tackle My Ride. We did. Uh, we went around and fixed up cars. Uh, so I auditioned for that show, and I beat a couple guys out that was had been on TV. You know, I'm like, okay, they're coming out the gate. <laughs> All right, yeah, I know me. <laughs> you know, so 
do that for two years. And while I was on set for two years, man, I built some great relationships with people. Um, a lot of the production crew behind it, like I, like I said, once I'm this every, I'm in class now. I'm hand, I'm the host, and I'm hands on the executive producer there. I'm just learning all these different things. So after the first season is done, I hired a camera crew and did a show that I had wrote. So then the next time I actually wrote something, like I created, I wrote the whole uh, the whole strip, and it was called Draft Day, and uh, it was about my experience once I got to the NFL that a lot of people don't see that's dealing with off the field stuff as far as just dealing with family, friends, businesses, anything off the field that you don't see guys deal with. Uh, so I produced that. Um, had a few different conversations with some people about that. Didn't really go anywhere, but I'm in the process of redoing that right now. Um, then uh, <clears throat> I did a show on, um, I did a radio show on 9, 10 a.m. Um, radio for a two hour show. I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about. You know, I had talked to Kevin Adele who, who owns the station. And he said, hey man, just talk about whatever you want. So I turned down deals with different companies I could have done and made money, but he gave me the opportunity to be me. Mm-hmm. Talk about whatever you wanted to talk. And to me, that was more important than money because I had opportunities for, for people to get to know me. Right. Um, so I did that show every Tuesday. Uh, then I came back and I put a, a documentary uh, show on his network, on the Word Network called The Journey with Lamar Woodley. Uh, talking and I interviewed uh, a couple different people. I can't even remember everybody. Uh, Q Parker from 112, uh, Soleil, uh, Josh, Shoot, I don't know, man. Yeah. But uh, I interviewed them, and the show is, is pretty much based on talking about the journey in life. And Because people always would ask me, Lamar, man, when you going to retire, man? When you going to put your papers in? I'm like, I haven't retired yet, man. I'm like, I'm only 30-something. This ain't retirement. I just <laughs> – the NFL was just a bump in the road, bro. This, that NFL was a bump to get to where I'm going. Like, Ooh, that, that's powerful. Was, you know what I'm saying? That, that, was, that was a pit, st- pit stop. Um, so when I did the journey, I wrote the opening of it and I went, I knew how I wanted to design it. Like, I'm like, yo, this is how we finna shoot the opening. Like I wrote it. This is how we finna shoot the opening. I'm going to be in the locker room. I, my cleats just put away, you know what I'm saying? I got my suit on. I walk out, I do a press conference, but the press conference, you thought I was going to say I was retiring, but it's not. I was just telling you that I'm still on the journey, you Mm. know, because we go through the ups and downs, but I'm still on my journey. So it was like. I just ain't no retirement speech. Uh, so I did 10 episodes of that. Um, and I just shot a movie, man. Dang, I'm long-winded. I told a you. Movie. Yeah, you just, shot a movie? Yeah. Come on, man. You oh, look at this. Like film, shot writing, a movie. production. I mean, I, I, I got to know, you know, where did this creative side come from? Did you always know this was something that you kind of had? Or did it kind of just come on as you were starting to do uh, some of these radio appearances, like you said, building relationships with people and learning everything you could while you were around them? Man, I got a big imagination. Like my imagination is, I, I think big. You know, I, I think about it. I can, I can see something. I can visualize something. I can put myself in that situation and visualize it me and that lifestyle, or I can visualize that and I understand in order to get that, what you're going to have to do to get there. Different people that you might have to not deal with no more in order to get there. So you have to be able to see it. And I, and I see those things. And for me, you know, I can sit back and I'm watching a film and you talk about, man, I would have did this or man, I would have did that. All right. Well, now it's your chance to see all that stuff that you talked about if you can actually do it. But to me, I shot a movie and whether I, whether the people like it or they don't, I still won because I took something that I thought about in my head and brought it to life. And I was part of the writing. I was part of the, the, the DP and picking the scenes out. So in my head, I'm, I'm winning regardless yeah. because I, I put this out here and I've done, I said that I was going to do it and I did it. And now it's, I didn't go out here and get the big actors. Why I didn't get the big actors? Because I want to see what I can do. If I go get Mike Epps and put him in the movie, in the movie sale, I don't know how good I am because Mike Epps is in the movie. But if I do it myself and I give a lot of these actors around here an opportunity 
and the script is good, the shooting is good, everything on point, now I get to see how good I am. Now, <laughs> my bad, go ahead. No, you go ahead. It's your, it's your it's be, before I shot the movie, I, I wrote another show. Um, I wrote another show. It, I don't want to give away an idea too much, but it's a good show. It's kind of like, it's like Shark Tank. It's like Shark Tank. I wrote it up one night. It took me one night to write that show up. I came up with the idea in one night. Mm. And that one night I came up with the idea and it was an agent in, um, it was an agent in, uh, an agent in um, LA that I still was dealing with. He gave me an opportunity and I said, I got this idea, man. I want you to tell me what you think. He said, Lamar, I like the idea. Let me, let me shop it around and see what some people think. So it was about seven production companies that I met with. He said, they want to meet with you and partner up with you on this idea. Because I'm a new production company, they're not going to give me the big budget because I'm not proven. I understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I meet with these, these seven production companies. I'm like, I'm meeting with seven people on an idea that I wrote up in one night? <laughs> I'm interviewing them and stuff who, you know, so I ended up picking this, this one company. Um, we flushed out the idea. We, for, for about a year, we worked on it. To me, that's too slow. You know what I'm saying? This, mm -hmm. this a whole year, we just working on the idea. So then we had a chance to pitch it. So in the first pitch meetings, I met with Netflix, Amazon, Discovery, CBS, NBC, CNBC, mm. And I think Fox on my first go around. Wow. Now they, they said no. But I'm cool with no. Because on my first show, really, that I'm pitching, I'm in here with all the big dogs. I'm in here with the big dogs that's been around for years. I'm thinking, if I go pitch this to this network right here, I'm golden. I'm just going <laughs> to wait. I'll wait. Man. What's that? What, I mean, what is that like? Like you said, you come up with a show idea in one night, and then you're meeting with with people from Netflix and Amazon. I mean, are you? Let me ask you this: How much of your experience from your playing career, like you said, being able to lock in and show up on Sundays, do you take into a meeting like that with a television executive? Hey, I'm just I'm just being me because I can't. I'm not going to come in there and be phony because I, I'm not going to be phony around you every time I see you because that's putting on an act. I can't do it. So when you get me and I'm talking about my show, I'm talking about it with the same and love and care that I've been putting in with the idea in one night. But since the last year, since we've been flushing out the idea even more, my thoughts into that. So I have a lot of passion in, into this. You know what I'm saying? So when you talk to me, this is just who you're going to get. I can't, I can't be nobody else. Mm. I would feel fun. I couldn't sleep at night knowing I'm somebody else, man. I'm fronting around with people. <laughs> I sleep good just knowing, hey, I'm Lamar Woodley. This is what you get right here. <laughs> and you know, I'm sitting here, my mind is still bugging out because I'm saying, man, you can get paid for having a, a good imagination. I thought I was crazy. Like, come on, we can bring that to life and make some money on come it. So what? I have to I have to call you, Lamar. We gotta get together on that, man. Listen, let me tell you. <laughs> Star Wars came from somebody imagination. I watch crazy movies like that. I like Star Wars. I like Lord of the Ring. I like movies like Rocky. I like all the uh all the Marvel movies. I was into that stuff before they started making the movies, the transform. I love that. That stuff came from somebody's mind. <laughs> and they put that on paper and then they said let's shoot it right. and everybody go out to the movies and they watch that stuff because it's in their minds too they didn't read the Lord of the Rings books or whatever they didn't read all those things so it's it's an imagination that somebody's created and if you think it's crazy then you ain't then you have no imagination mm -hmm. and that's why Star Wars is still making money he's sitting at home right now and all he got to do, look at his account. Yeah, another <laughs> hundred million. <laughs> what? <laughs> Off your imagination? Avatar. Come on, man. They, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and let me ask you this, too, because you said something. I don't want people to, to I don't want it to slide by. I want to bring light to it. You said they said no. But the next thing you said, but that's okay. That's okay. And then you just kept it moving. So can you talk a little bit about it? Because some people kind of could have got discouraged or gave up. You said they said no, but that's okay. And you just kept it moving. When you said no, all you did was add a fire to the flame. 
That's yeah. what Shorty Lowe said that. I like that. He added fire to the flame. Mm. Because no means I need to take it to a whole nother level. And that, that no is like, oh, okay. Oh, you don't think so? Now I'm going to shoot this movie now. And I'm going to show why I'm good. So now, next time you come and talk to me, I ain't, I ain't, it was a, I ain't saying nothing about them company, but next time somebody come and talk to me, I ain't going to be as cheap <laughs> on the next go around. <laughs> you could have got me for cheap. But now, you, it's like the Master P thing. You know when, how Master P, I like watching like Master P and Dame Dash, the stuff that they talk about. Like, yes. you, you got to go out here and show I can put up numbers. This is what I can do. So now we all know like how it is in athletics. When you putting up numbers, you're a little bit cuter. You get what I'm saying? Yes. They, 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 they don't mind giving you the big contracts. Now all of a sudden you went from ugly and now the girl saying you fine. You get So now all of a sudden it's like a whole different level. So now when, when I get to that level, now you just can't get me with anything because I've proven that I can do this. Right. I can you, uh, do you, you said something that really resonated with me, Lamar, and I know that you talked about you know football just being a part of your journey and that you had bigger aspirations and clearly um, – you know, you're doing your thing right now uh, in the film world and with, with all the production uh, that you have going on. But you said that you really wanted to create a different brand after you took the helmet off. You had a vision for what you wanted your post-football career to look like. What would your advice be to football players who don't have that same vision, who don't really know what's going to come after football? What would you say to them? Stop looking at that next big contract. Mm. It's, it's 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 okay to in to dream that and see that next contract, but don't be physically at that moment spending like you already got that big contract. Mm. In this game, we have to prepare for the worst because your last play could be at practice. Your last play could be if something happened to you just walking outside. Anything can happen to you. So you have to prepare as if that day is going to come. And you have to utilize who you are as a star and your celebrity status and not just use it to get into the clubs. Use that celebrity status to go out there and meet some executives. Wow. And go out here and meet some people that you're going to need 10 years after you've done because you might be done tomorrow. So go out here and build relationships. Stop using yourself and building relationships in the wrong areas and use them in the right areas. Mm. Because when your star stops shining and you ain't built no relationship, trust me, them phone calls ain't going to be coming no more. But you got to be, you have to already understand, you know that's coming. You, you got to understand, you can't be, yeah, everybody mess with me. No, you have to understand some people only deal with you because you're an athlete. Mm-hmm. And when you're no longer playing, they ain't going to pick up the phone. See, a lot of people be hurt by that because they thought that they had some real relationships. And really, those relationships wasn't real. That was just based on, hey, man, give me some tickets. Yeah, man, I get you in the club. Yeah, man, I, you know, negotiate and send this stuff. You do this for me. I, but once that's over with and you have nothing to offer, nobody's going to deal with you. So you, you have to be in that mindset, understanding who you are as a person and how some people are. See, so for me, I built real relationships. I can still call these people to this day. I can still call, I don't go around here and on social media trying to look relevant. I don't have to post different things of looking, I don't have to, because I know who I am. I can, mm-hmm. I can call 10, 10, 20 people and move that way. I ain't got to move on social media. So I understand that about myself and the relationships that I've built with people are, bigger than sports because anybody that know me really know I will, when you around me, we ain't talking about no sports. We talking about real life stuff to talk about how we're going to elevate and get to the next level. We're going to talk, we're going to be a little bit, talk a little football. But after that, Hey bro, I don't do that no more. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm going this way. <laughs> now, you know, I'm glad you hit on that. And I, and I get chill bumps, Lamar, when you talk like that, because I, you know, we look at a, a guy like magic Johnson that has benefited so much business-wise off relationships. Yeah. You look at LeBron James, you look at yourself, you look at a lot of people and you say, wow, like, why you have these people attention? Why not ask a question? You know, what did you invest in? How did you get that? You know, I, I, what made you a, a CEO of this company or whatever it is? You got all these people at your hand. I mean, at your, you, you got access to all these people 
And why not get something from that? Opposed to just saying, you know, I know this person or, and, and, need, and then years go by and you got absolutely nothing out of it. So I think that's very important that you said that and people need to, that should resonate with someone in sports, in business or whatever the case is. When you're around these people, get something out of that and, and, and definitely benefit on building relationships because that's what's going to take it to the next level in the long run. <laughs> And man, I had an opportunity to um, to be a part of the Jordan brand and meet Michael Jordan. Mm. And I never thought in a million years I couldn't afford Michael Jordan's <laughs> to being a part of one of the best brands ever. Right. To have an opportunity to go to Michael Jordan house. Ooh. Oh. I met, I called Mike up and said, can I come down there? What? I met Michael Jordan. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, man. So, hey, one of the most humble, humble, humble guy, family mm. guy. Like, I understand. If they talking about that guy that's on his teammates and all that. I don't know nothing about that because the one that I've met consistently is a good, humble dude that care about you and your family. Wow. That's that's one of those brands right there. People wish they can be. See, people wish that they can be a part of the brand to wear the gear. Mm-hmm. You know, I got the shirt on, but people wish to be. I couldn't afford the gear. I'm a part of something that's special. The gear is extra to me. That's extra. But to yeah. be a part of the family is a whole different thing. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Yes. It's a it's a whole different thing. It, it means something more to me than just the gear. I didn't. I never bragged about being part of the Jordan brand. It, nah, I'm part of the family. Yes. <laughs> and there's perks that come with that, right? And guess what? Like saying, I ain't got to wear the gear all the time. You know, I'm a part of the family. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? That meant more to me. So. Yeah, I don't know where I went with that. I just... Hey, yeah. I, I'm, I got, I'm jealous. You picking up the phone and calling Michael George, man. Not bad, right? Everybody in the world wants that, that yeah, access. Yeah, wow. hey, hey, Lamar, I, I got to ask you, um, what when you think about, you know, everything you've accomplished, both on and off the field, and we talked about, you know, you played in a Rose Bowl, won a Super Bowl, you were an All-Pro, all these different awards. Now what you're doing in the in the world of TV and film, when it's all said and done, what do you want your legacy to be? It's like what you just said. I want to. I want my legacy to be <clears throat> the Woodley family is finally up there. They finally won't have to work as hard. You still have to work, but you don't have to work as hard that I've worked. Mm. Because anytime that you see somebody's family that's in a great situation, somebody had to lay them bricks down. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then once them bricks start laying down, generations start eating, everybody start looking different. But the person that laid them bricks down, you're going to have to always take your hat off to that person because they built a strong foundation that can be around for generations. So that's me. When I grew up and I see, you know, kids having certain things or got them J's on their feet and I got to live through somebody else's feet, you know what I'm saying? Or you you see the, the neighborhood dope dealer selling drugs, getting money. He looking fly. You mad. You want that. You you want those things, what I'm saying. Those are motivational things. But then you realize somebody has to put some type of work in to really establish money. And not just money, but money where it's stacked up, where you don't have to worry about it no more. Where when I get older, my kids can go to the best school. My kids can have everything that I ever imagined. And they can do things that I was only can imagine. I want to do that for them. You know what I'm saying? So in order for me to do that, I have to stack these and we have to build a generation up. I want to live like this till I'm dead and gone. And then like people always say, you can't die with it. You don't supposed to. I'm going to pass it on to the next people. And right. we're going to continue to build on that. So in 2000 and whatever, 90 or 2100, uh, <laughs> has established something. I'm going to have a statue somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They always say, baby, if you can count it, it ain't a lot of money. <laughs> hey. Well, uh, you know, this is... This, this has been a lot of fun. This has been a lot of fun, you know, just getting to to hear all kinds of different things about your path. I think a lot of things that no one's ever heard before. Um, and <laughs> oh, yeah. Just just some great stories. And, um, you know, no, 
no wonder why you're, you're having so much success in your endeavors uh, in your post football career. And I don't even have to ask this question because you, you basically already answered it, but do you miss playing at all? Ooh, not one bit. <laughs> not one bit, brother. Not one, not one bit. Yeah. Like it, it's, it was fun and, you know, like teammates and going out there playing, like it was, it was fun. But the fun ha- has to end at, at, at some point. And if you understand yourself, we did talk about that. If you understand that this game is not for long, that you 22, you ain't, pl- you ain't playing till you 50. You ain't playing till you 40 unless you Tom Brady. And you ain't playing that long. So anytime that you get done with this game, even when Tom Brady done playing, you're still a young man. You, they just called you old in football, so you start believing that our old man. You no, you ain't no old man. That's what the young players say, man. Our old school. They call you old school. You thirty years old. Old school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a young man Out, outside these walls. You ain't old school. You you young man, and yeah. you have to realize that because if you start putting that in your mind that you you old school, now you oh man. I, well, it, it, I'm telling you, man, I got to warm up before I go. Man, you talking old. Right. You put that in your head, you're going to start feeling old. <laughs> yes. And, that, and, and it's funny, Jay. Well, I knew how he was going <clears> to <throat> answer that question. And another reason he didn't hit on it, but I will hit on it. He gave it, a, he gave it everything he had. Oh, you yeah. Lamar Woolley gave it everything he had. So it's easy to walk away when you know you gave everything you possibly had. So I, I knew, uh, LeBron, I knew how you was going to answer that question. Yeah, ain't nothing else done. Like, all right, how much more money are you trying to make? All right, how many, I'm thinking, how many more days I got for these damn training camps? I be thinking that training, it's hot as hell. I could be on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, I mean, money. the injuries too. I mean, football is a brutal game. I mean, you went through your share of injuries like a lot of players do. No, honestly, though, the, to be able to accomplish a lot of things, and realize as you're still playing, you know, what else are you trying to accomplish? Because at the end of the day, I came in this game and said that I wanted to play about 10 years. I played nine. I said mm-hmm. I wanted to play about 10 years. So no matter how much success that I had, <clears throat> when I got to that 10 year, I was I was going to be done. Because the, what I wanted to do, I, I did everything I wanted to do. And the most important thing that I wanted to do is be able to walk away from the game and not be – uh, you can no longer play no more due to this. I never wanted to hear that because now I understand that I got to live the rest of my life with this. And yeah, we're, we're, we, I, I got my I got my issues that I have now, but not them issues where they got to cart you off the field or yeah. you know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm walking around here with my, my shoulder, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, so to be able to walk away from the game is one of the most important things to me when you know I've accomplished everything. There's yeah. nothing else for me to accomplish. Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, all them things you mentioned. There's nothing else for me to accomplish. Hall of Fame, guess what? That was never in my – I've I, I never put that at the top of my list. I wasn't a football – I wasn't a, a football junkie. <laughs> you get what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do, do I got numbers for Hall of Fame? Hell no. Why would I ever even – Think about that now. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, everything I accomplished, everything. I don't need nobody to validate me to say who I am. I know who I am. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't need no. I don't need no. I don't need none of that stuff to understand who I am. I'm, I'm a Hall of Famer to myself because I'm just right. a great person. <laughs> and you, you, know, you know what? And you and you walked away on your own terms. And, and for anybody, it, you know, no matter what what your passion is, uh, to be able to do that, there's there's a lot to be said for that. So um, we we know that uh, there's there's more great things to come for you. I mean, I I have a feeling, Mateen, we're going to be seeing him walking the red carpet one day, uh, maybe oh, at yeah. the Oscars, at the Emmys. I mean, one of these shows, you're going to flip on the TV one day and be like, wait a second, is that Lamar <laughs> Woodley? The hey, winner I'm, is going to find you, a way to win. I'm going to tell you what. If if somebody give me that opportunity, they're going to get a they they going to get a hard working dude that they never seen before. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't give me the opportunity, eventually you're going to see me cuz I'm working right now. But when that opportunity comes, you go you're going to get a hard working dude you ain't never seen before. You you're going to get a leader you ain't never seen before. Then they say no, the quarterback no days got off. A smart one. That's the mentality. <laughs> oh yeah. So when I put this movie out, I'm gonna need to come back on here to come on here and promote my movie when we it got comes you. out. 
Oh, we'll we'll look forward to watching it. We'll give you the critique. We'll be brutally honest, just like you. That's what I expect. I don't expect nothing less. <laughs> nothing less. You ain't gonna hurt my feelings. Hey, Lamar, the movie suck. Damn, bro, what I need to do to work on it? Okay, let me write that down so I don't make that mistake again. <laughs> well, hey, we uh, we appreciate you taking the time. It's been really great uh, talking with you. Great conversation. Uh, keep up the great work, and uh, hopefully we get to see you in person sometime soon. Uh, definitely, man. Appreciate y'all for having me on. All right. Good stuff, baby. To make sure you never miss an episode of Power Forward, subscribe wherever you find your podcasts and leave us a review. And look for another new episode coming your way two weeks from now featuring more inspirational stories of success. I'm Justin White. We'll see you next time on Power Forward.